Well, good morning. Aren't you glad it's not raining today? I was starting to think, uh, why does it always rain on Sunday? Seems like it's uh, dry during the week and it r- rains on Sunday. Hey, uh, I appreciate Stephen and the worship team. Didn't they do a great job leading us in worship today? I appreciate them so very much. So let me ask you today, how many of you watched the TV program Lost? Do we have any Lost fans in here? Boy, not as many as I thought. So uh, Lost, if you didn't watch the program, it was a television show about the survivors of a plane crash. Not, not a real story, obviously, but survivors of a plane crash. The plane crashed in, in a remote, unknown South Pacific island, and it kind of told their story. It ranks as one of the most popular television shows of all time. It went from September 2004 to May of 2010. Now, uh, confession, full disclosure, Vicki and I didn't watch it when it originally aired, but we did binge watch it. All 121 episodes we binge watched, all right? Not at, not at one time. I don't want you to think we were like in our house, didn't shave for six days and didn't eat anything, but, but we watched all 121 episodes. And like anyone else, I don't want to give it away if you haven't watched it, but like everyone else, we were fascinated by the fact that there were polar bears on this South Pacific island. If you watched it, you remember, remember the smoke monster? And we're always sitting back thinking, okay, what is the smoke monster? And then after being on the island for a year or so, they found the others. Remember the others, the people who had, who had lived on the island for a period of time? And then they found the underground bunker. Then there was the strange number sequence, all of that stuff. Anybody with me on that? I mean, it was, it was a cra- it's one of those programs that absolutely captivated you. And then, then the finale came. And if you remember, there was so much hoopla about the finale. Everyone loved the show, and then the finale came, and everybody was waiting for the finale. They say more than 13 million people watched the finale. I'm not a TV critic, but it was an absolute dud. (laughs) Am I right, those that are Lost fans, if you watched it? I mean, the, the, the finale just didn't live up to the program. The program was so much better. Matter of fact, the finale left more unanswered questions than it answered the question. So if you're looking for something to do this afternoon, go home and on Netflix, you can binge watch 121 hours of Lost. (laughs) I say that because many people in the world today view life that way. They view the life that we live, our present program, as being far better or far greater than the conclusion. We put more emphasis on this life than we do the life to come. I want to ask Stephen to come, and I I just kind of want to illustrate this for just a second. This was an illustration that Francis Chan has done, and I think Vicki said that I've done it once or twice before, and so if you've seen this illustration, please bear with me, but it's just a great illustration, and so Stephen, if you'll just take that and run the other way. Run, run, run as fast as you can. Run, run the other way. All right, there you go. There we go. All right, so, so, so this is a, whoa, 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 whoa. We can play tug of war. Stephen and I can play tug of war. All right, so I want you to see this. I want you to imagine this rope as your life. This is your life, all right? All of this. You say, man, Brian, you're expecting me to live a long life. I like that, right? No, no, here's what I want you to catch. See this black part right here? This is your life on earth. And so whether you live 50 years or whether you live 60 years or whether you live 80 years or whether you're one of those fortunate ones that lived to 98 or 104 or whatever it is, however long you live, this is your life on earth. And you say, Brian, what is the rest of it then? All 99 feet of it, what is the rest of it? That is your life in eternity. You see, we were created to live for eternity. I would remind you that Song of Solomon said that God has placed eternity in our hearts. 
So, so here's my challenge for you today. Why do we put more emphasis on this little area than we do the rest of our lives? We live our lives, we make decisions, we, uh, we, uh, we do everything we do based upon what is going to happen right here, and we don't live for the rest of our lives. We don't live for the rest of eternity. Does that make sense today? Let's give Stephen a hand. He did such a great job. Just leave it, just leave it there, Stephen. I appreciate it. So, so, so here's what I want you to catch today. Your future is better than your present. You might sit back today and say, Brian, that's great news because my present isn't very good. But you might be here today and say, Brian, I like my life. I like what, what, what's happening in my life. I'm in a good place right now. I don't want to experience the future. Here's what I want you to catch today as we end this series. God's future for you is so much better than you could ever, ever imagine. And so my challenge is, as we conclude this series, is not just to live for today, but my challenge is for each and every one of us to live for eternity. Take your Bibles with me or your iPhone or your iPad, whatever you have, and turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. As a matter of fact, just go to the very end of your Bible, very last page, and then turn one page back. Unless you have a concordance or maps, don't go to the maps, but go to, go to Revelation chapter 21. We're going to read just five verses, and today we talk about the end of God's story. And today we want this message to be incredibly encouraging to you, incredibly in cha uh, challenging to you as you see what God has planned for us. Revelation 21, beginning in verse 1, John writing this, this, about this vision that he had. John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Let me pause there for a second because those of us who live in South Florida and we love the ocean, we love you know, going to Hollywood Beach, or we love going to the West Coast, we love going to Naples Beach, you love taking your boat out and snorkeling or fishing to sit back and say, what? What are you talking about? Heaven's not going to have an ocean, no snorkeling in heaven, no swimming in heaven? What's going on there? I, I'm not sure that John is actually saying that our future home has no ocean. Some would sit back and say that, that the term ocean, the term sea there, refers to this dangerous place. And in, in, in ancient times, they viewed the ocean as a place of chaos, a place of destruction, a place of darkness. And so I'm not exactly sure what John is saying there, but I personally believe, sit back, take a deep breath. I I believe there's going to be oceans in our future home, all right? And I believe you're going to be able to swim or sunbathe, whatever you want to do there, all right? Okay. Are, are we good? Are we good? All right. Verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, this is significant because through most of the book of Revelation, an angel is speaking, but John hears God speaking. Notice the voice comes from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. I love verse 4. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. I love verse 5. I love it. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Would you read that verse 5 with me? That's such a powerful statement. Let's read it together. Verse, verse 5. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. No, we want to talk about what that means, but here's what I want to challenge you the thought with today, that God wants to take the struggles, the trials, the burdens, the tribulations of your life, and God wants to a certain degree turn them upside down, and God wants to make your life, God wants to make your future absolutely brand new. 
And the truth is, God has a great future for us as his children. Would you pray with me today? Lord, today we, we, man, we've just paused. We've been able to sing some great songs. You, you are so very good to us. Every one of us here today, from the richest to the poorest, from the, from the, the healthiest to the most sickly, every one of us here today can say that you have been extremely good to us. And we thank you for the work of the cross that blesses us, as the song said, both now and forever. So God, help us today to see the end of the story. Help us to realize that you have already written the end of the story. Help us to understand it. Help us to embrace it. Excite our hearts today with what you have planned for us. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So, so if you've been here, you know for the past three weeks, we have been telling the story of God. And, and we started clear back in the beginning of the Bible with creation, and we saw that God created the world from nothing. We saw that the world and man, we were created for a purpose. As, as God's representatives, man and woman, were given the responsibility of taking care of God's creation, of, of enlarging it and filling it with people who would be the very image bearers of God. And as God looked at his creation, he made this statement, it's good, it's good. We then saw the fall. And we saw how Adam and Eve succumbed to temptation as a result of their sin, as a result of them giving in to their temptation. They lost everything. They lost their immortality. They, they lost their intimacy with God. They lost their access to paradise. They were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and, and God actually put a cherubim with a flaming sword right there, basically saying, you're not coming in here again. They lost everything. And then we saw that their sinful nature and the consequences of their sin was passed on to us as well. Brad last week did such a great job of talking about the third part of that story, redemption. And we saw from the very moment of their fall in Genesis chapter 3 that God had a plan. God wasn't caught off guard. God wasn't caught by surprise. God had a plan. And the plan very simply was Jesus. And Jesus came to the rescue. And Jesus defeated our enemy. And Jesus freed us from the bondage of sin. So that those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ can truly say, we are free. We're free in Jesus Christ. So now this, on this last study, we ask the question, how does the story end? How, how does God end this magnificent story that he's writing, not only about his creation, but how does his story end? And more importantly, how does your story end? How does, how does my story end? Well, God's fairy tale ending, and I say that not in the, in the sense that it's, this, that it's uh, fiction, but it's, I say that in the sense that it is far greater than you and I could ever imagine. God's fantastic ending is found in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. Now, before we jump into the verses that we read just a few moments, I want to do a little bit of a correlation from what we saw in the very beginning to what we're seeing today. Because we saw it, we started in Genesis chapter 1, the first chapter of the Bible, and we're ending in, in Revelation 21 and 22, the last two chapters of the Bible. And I want you to see that there is an unbelievable connection between these two chapters. Sometimes we view the Bible as like this, this road, this jagged road that doesn't have a direct purpose, but you're going to see as we look at the last two chapters of the Bible that God is finishing what he started in the first two chapters of the Bible. We're going to see that God's plan is perfectly fulfilled, and God's plan is for perfectly completed. So think with me. Think with me for a few moments about what transpired in Genesis chapter 1 and what transpires in Revelation chapter 21. So Genesis is the book of beginning. 
Revelation is the book of ending. In Genesis, the earth is created. In Revelation 21 and 22, we see that the earth passes away and the earth is renovated. In Genesis 1 and 2, we see that Satan rebels against God. At the end of the story, we see that Satan is defeated. In Genesis, we see that the curse is given. In Revelation, we see that the curse is erased. And and the word that's used has the idea of being erased. In Genesis, sorrow and suffering enter into the world. In Revelation, sorrow and suffering end. They exist no more. In Genesis, we saw at the end of chapter 3, the tree of life is guarded. And man did not have access to the tree of life. As we come to the end of Revelation, man is once again given access to the tree of life. I would encourage you to read Revelation 22 because the, the tree of life is mentioned three times in the last chapter of the Bible. So much so that John says this, he who conquers has access to the tree of life. So here's what I want you to see. God's story that he began in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, he is ending in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. God concludes his story. So if you have your outline, there's a couple of real simple things that I want us to see today, and I want you to walk away with an understanding of your future. The first thing that I wrote down in my notes is this. The final chapter of God's story has already been written. Catch that. The final chapter of God's story has already been written. God is not writing the story as he goes. We have some theologians today that believe in something called open theism, and the idea is that God doesn't know the future. God is writing the future as it happens. I don't see that in Scripture. You see, the future is not ambiguous. The future is not uncertain. The future is not still to be determined. There is is no doubt in the mind of God. There might be doubt in our mind, but there is no doubt in the mind of God what is planned for the future. Everything has been meticulously planned. Uh, I had a pastor that worked with me in in Mexico. His name was Claudio Jimenez. Some of you know him. Claudio is one of our missionaries now in Argentina. And whenever we'd give Claudio a job to do, I'd call him and say, so Claudio, are we ready to go? And he would always use this phrase. He'd say, Brian, todo está fríamente calculado. Everything is coldly calculated. Everything is perfectly planned. And Claudio was a detail guy. When he said it was fríamente calculado, guess what? It was perfectly planned. Well, I can tell you today that the future that God has for you and me is friamente calculado, that God has perfectly planned everything. Here's just a couple of verses, Psalm 33, 11. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, I am God and there is none other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring, notice what he says, the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel, the idea of the counsel is his decisions, my counsel will stand and I will accomplish my purpose. Sometimes you and I watch the news and we watch what's happening around us and we think, what in the world is going on? Has God lost control? Let me assure you today that God has not lost control. His purpose, his counsel, his decisions stand and he will accomplish his purpose. So I say this, God's story is one of faithfulness and goodness And because we know the author of the story personally, we can trust his will. We can watch even the story of our own lives unfold and sit back and wonder with awe. Even when we get to the scene and that scene is confusing or it seems out of place. You ever been through a scene in your life and you sit back and think, how in the world does this fit in God's plan? 
Everything was going so well. I mean, I loved my job, and I, I loved what was happening. Out of the blue, I'm fired. God, how does that happen? Or, or life is going perfectly, and all of a sudden, I have this sickness. And we sit back, and we're a little bit confused. We can remember. We can wait. We can watch, knowing that the storyline of God's story for his story and for our lives is moving towards a beautiful and a glorious end. And we can have faith. So how does this story end? Revelation chapter 21 and 22 gives us a glimpse of that. The second thing that I wrote in my notes is this. God's story ends with the renovation of his creation. God's story ends with the renovation of his creation. John says this in verse 1 of Revelation 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Let, let's just remember what we've studied in recent weeks because we saw that not only were we affected by the fall, but we saw that the earth in which we live was also affected by the fall. Weeds, thorns, thistles, Deserts, dried up lake beds, earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis are all the result of a planet that was thrust into chaos. That's not my word, that's a biblical word. The planet in which we live because of sin was thrust into chaos. The world that we know today, as beautiful as it is, and there are so many parts that are absolutely gorgeous, but the world that we know today is not as God originally intended for it to be. I want you to see a couple of verses that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, because Paul is talking about not only our redemption, but he's talking about the redemption of the world in which we live. Notice Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 18. Paul said, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. That's what Stephen was talking about just a few moments ago. We're going through suffering and we sit back and think, okay, God, what's going on? And God says, just wait. The sufferings that you're going through now are nothing compared to the glory that you're going to see and experience in the future. Verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing, for the revealing of the sons of God. And so, so creation itself is sitting back saying, okay, God, we're waiting to be redeemed. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him, God, who subjected it in hope. So God subjected it, but in hope because God has a plan. Verse 21, that the creation itself will be set free. Remember Brad talked about last week the word redemption. What does the word redemption mean? To be set free from what? Bondage. The fact that we were in bondage, the sin. And so Paul says that the creation itself will be redeemed, set free from its bondage to corruption, and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. You say, Brian, what does that mean? Well, here's what I wrote in my notes, and you can write this down. The physical world, the world that we know, earth, the planet on which we live, the physical world will be redeemed from its bondage and restored to its original condition. Now, there's a lot of debate among theologians. Will, will the earth that we live in now be destroyed, and will he make a new one? Some say that's what Revelation 21 is saying. I tend to think like the reformers, that the idea is not that God's going to destroy the planet and build a brand new one, but I think God's going to take this planet that we live in, and God is going to restore it to its perfect condition. Think with me. The world in which we live is contaminated with pollution. Animal life is restricted Paradise has been overtaken by civilization. Although still beautiful, our planet is a mere shadow of what God intended for it to be. One day, though, that will change. That will change. And God will take that which is polluted, aged, rusted, and mildewed and make it into what he intended for it to be. I love verse 5. Verse 5, he says this, Behold, I am making all things new. 
Hey, you know what a new car smells like? You know how great it is to walk into a brand new house? You know how great it is to put on brand new clothes? God says, I'm going to renovate the world in which we live, that for you and I, it is going to be something new. Let me show you something else that might blow you away a little bit. If you want to argue with me about this afterward, you're more than welcome to do that. But, But I want you to catch this. Lots of times we think that when we die, we're going to spend the future up in the clouds somewhere. Uh, I think Brad said, you know, sitting on a cloud, dressed in a diaper, playing a harp, you know. I think that's what he said last week. Well, here in Revelation 21, here's what John says. John says that heaven comes to earth instead of earth's inhabitants going to heaven. That's what John is saying. John is saying, I see this new heaven, this city, the new Jerusalem, that that God, that Jesus has been preparing for us. And what happens to that? That comes down to earth. And and it it is right here where we live. Think of that, church. That is the answer to the Lord's prayer when Jesus said, your kingdom come Your will be done. Finish it with me. What does he say? On earth as it is in heaven. It's what Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, where Paul says, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. Where? In earth and in heaven. So church, here's what I want you to get. I want you to get that God has this plan to take the world in which we live, this creation, and God has a plan to redeem it and to set it free from its bondage. Let me show you a second thing. If this doesn't make you stand up and shout, then I don't know what will. But the second thing is this. For believers, life will be restored to its original condition. Then you say, well, there you go. You say, Brian, well, th- this is the way I know life to be. Well, life is filled with, I-, I mean, a baby cries from the very moment of birth. So, so tears is a part of our existence. Pain is a part of our existence. We begin to age, we begin to die from the very moment of birth. That's what we know. But catch this. That's not what God had originally planned or intended for us. Now, I know the sovereignty of God and all of that, but that's that's not what God wants for us. And here in Revelation 21, John, as he's being told this by the Lord, he describes what our future life is going to be like. Verse 4, he says this, there will be no more tears, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. And God's people said amen to that. Listen, here's what I I wrote down. I don't think it's in your notes. I wrote down the struggles that we presently experience will be eradicated. No more temptation. No more spiritual battles. No more marital fights. No more trying to corral unruly kids. No more dealing with an irate boss. No more horrendous traffic. All of the struggles that we presently face will be gone. They'll be eradicated. The second thing that I said is this, the pain that we presently feel will be eliminated. Eliminated. I'm I'm, I'm 55 years old. Someone walked in today and said, Brian, man, you're looking younger every day. You're trying to look younger. And I said, yeah, I'm just trying to look 54 is all I'm trying to look, all right? Uh, I mean, I wake up in the morning and my body hurts. Do I have a witness? Does your body hurt, all right? I sit back and, 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 and exercise and think, oh my word, I can't even move for three days after that. And I can't remember what it was like to do it as a young man. The text says that one day all of that pain And I know some of you here experience chronic pain. All of that pain one day will be gone. 
The third thing that I wrote is this, the sorrows that we regularly endure will be erased, will be erased. You say, Brian, what does that mean? Let me just say it this way. No more dreaded doctor visits. No more funeral arrangements. No more hospital stays. No more broken families. No more goodbyes. No more depression. No more unhappiness. No more stiff and sore bodies. We could go on and on and on. Here, here's, what, here's what God says. I'm going to make everything new. <laughs> everything that you know, everything that you feel, everything that you possess, I am going to make everything new. <laughs> so here's what I want you to get. The end of the story. The end of the story is God renovating the world and creation and us, everything as we know it. Isn't that great? Let me show you a third thing. The story ends with God dwelling among his people. As great as the last point was, I want you to catch this one because it might not be as relevant to us, but it is much more important the story ends with God dwelling among his people. Verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. So the simple truth is God will live among us. The word dwell there has the idea of tabernacle. It comes from that Old Testament experience because as the children of Israel wandered through the desert, God told them to build a tabernacle and the tabernacle what? Was the presence of God. So they would look at the tabernacle and they would be reminded of the fact that God was with them. Then they built the temple and the temple was what? It was the place where God lived. And then Jesus came to earth. We're actually going to be in John chapter 1 next week and said, and the word became flesh and he tabernacled among us. Same word that's found here in Revelation chapter 21. God dwelt among us. And now that Jesus is gone, we have the Holy Spirit of God who indwells us. But God says, the day is coming when I will live among you. I will live with you. God dwells among his people. Here's the idea that God will build his house. He will permanently reside among his people. He will be visible. He will be approachable. You will never wonder if God sees you. You will never wonder if God hears you. You will never again wonder, God, where are you? You will never question if God loves you. Why? He will be with you. As your God, he will dwell among his people. I love you. Get to chapter 22 and verse 4, and, and here's the way it's described in chapter 22 and verse 4. It says this, they will see his face. If you remember in the Old Testament, they were told, you can't see the face of God and live. Remember that? But John says, oh, there's coming a day when we will see Jesus. Fanny Crosby said it this way, when my life's work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, in the glad song of ages I shall mingle with delight, I long to see my Savior first of all. God says, I'm going to live with you. You're going to have access to me. There's a second thing that I think is really cool in the passage because the second part of this, of, of it goes like this. As nations, tribes, or excuse me, all nations, tribes, and cultures will be united into one people group. I want you to get verse 3 if you see it. He says, and I hold a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling places of God is with man. He will dwell with them. And catch this phrase, they will be his people. Think with me what that means. No more racism. No more segregation. No more socioeconomic division. 
No more living on one side of the railroad tracks while somebody else, somebody better than you, lives on the other side of the railroad tracks. When, when we live in God's city in the future, we will all be equal. We will all be living together as one people, as one race. You say, Brian, how will we be known? We will be known very simply as this, the people of God. That's who we are. God dwells among us. We are God's people. We are united together in him. Oh, my word. Like you, I'm so tired of seeing everything that's happening in our society today. I'm so tired of the fighting. I'm so tired of the division. I'm so tired of the segregation. I'm tired of that. And God said, oh, there's coming a day. I'm building a city for you. I am renovating a planet for you in which none of that will exist. Everyone will be my people. All of us will be united together. You see, in the end of the story, God dwells with his people. Oh, that's so important to see. Let me show you one last thing, though. One last thing. In reality, though, the end of the story is the beginning of the story. In reality, the ending of the story is the beginning of the story. We have a tendency to view life this way. We have a tendency to have vision that this is all there is. And, and there's, a, there's a sadness involved when someone dies. There's a, there's a, there's a misunderstanding of that because we feel that Life is over. We know in our heads that it's not. We know that the Bible talks about the future. We know all of that, but to a certain degree, we sit back and we talk about, man, I want to accomplish what I want to accomplish because I have 70 years or I have 75 years. I have what it is. And, 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 and whenever a person dies, we stand over the casket and we lament because their life is over as if their story ended. And I'm here to tell you today that when your life is over, whenever that is, your story is not, has not come to an end. But for you and me, your story is just beginning. It is at the very beginning. We get to Revelation chapter 21 and 22 and we can easily think that we reach the conclusion. It's the end. After all, most books, you get to the end of the story and there's a what? There's a phrase that says, the end. If you get to the end of the Bible, you're not going to see a phrase that says the end. Why? Because it's not the end. It is just the beginning. And everything that God outlines for us in Revelation 21 and 22 is what he has planned for us. Catch this. Open up your minds. Expand your minds. Expand your hearts. It's everything he has planned for us forever and ever and ever. And ever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever. God says, I want to take care of you for all of eternity. For all of eternity, I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. I want to dwell with you. I want you to see my face. I want you to have no more pain, no more division, no more sorrow. I want you to be one people for all of eternity. So for you and for me, the story does not end with Revelation chapter 22, verse 21. It is just the beginning. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 2, 9. No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man, or nor has heart imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So today we end our series, God's Story. But here's what I want you to catch today, and we're done. But here's what I want you to catch. Just as God has written his story, 
God desires to write your story. He desires to write my story. And and I would submit to you today that your story and mine is very similar to God's story. You say, Brian, what do you talk about? Because we were created in his image. We were created to be his image bearers whenever you were born. October 5th, 1962, Brian came into the world, and I was created to be the image bearer of God. But guess what? It didn't take very long for Brian to blow it. Matter of fact, mom would say that in the womb with my twin brother, we were fighting in the womb. And so uh, we probably were exhibiting carnality there in the womb. And I was born first, so that means that I probably beat the tar out of him in the womb and escaped first. I'm not exactly sure. But, but, But from very early in my life, I blew it. I fell. And guess what I needed? I needed a redeemer. I needed a hero who would come into my life and save me from myself, save me from my own sinful condition, save me from my own carnal desires, someone who would come in my life and rewrite my story. My story was headed in one direction, but someone who would come in and say, Brian, I can take all the mistakes that you made, I can take all of the problems that you've ever had, and I have the ability to erase all of that, and I have the ability to make you brand new in Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful that there was a moment in my life where he came in and he changed me, and God took the story that was being written one way, and God completely changed it for his, author, for his honor and for his glory. And God desires to do the exact same thing for you. You might be here today and say, Brian, you have no idea the mistakes that I made. I don't, but God does. You said, Brian, you have no idea the sins that I've committed. I don't. But God does. And not only does God know it, but God loves you. And God cares for you. And God desires to rewrite your story. Paul Tripp said it this way. Talking about this exact thing, he says, Thankfully, I am not the author of my own personal story. Your story isn't an autobiography either. Your story is a biography of wisdom and grace written by God. Every problem he writes in your story is right. Every plot, every twist is for the best. Every new character or unexpected event is a tool of grace that God is writing into your story. Every new chapter advances his purpose. So here's the way Paul says it in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. He who began a good work in you will what? Will finish it. Will complete it on the day of Jesus Christ. God's story. Creation. Fall. Redemption. Glory. God has a glorious future for you and a glorious future for me. I don't know what you're going through today. You might be struggling and say, Brian, I don't like the chapter I'm in right now. I know I've been in those chapters. I've been there. But remember that the end has already been written. And God desires to fulfill, complete, to bring you to the place to be an image bearer of Jesus Christ. So I'd ask today, have you surrendered the pen? Have you surrendered the paper? Are you allowing God to rewrite your story? You say, Brian, how does that take place? It takes place when you realize that you've blown it and you just rip the paper out, crumble it, throw it away, and say, okay, God, here's the pad of my life. Make me into who and what you want me to be. And the cool thing is that God will do that, and he'll start a work in your life that will go on and on and on and on and on for all of eternity. Amen. Stand with me today as Stephen comes. I can't say it with 
enough passion this morning. If you're here today and you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you've never reached out to him and said, man, my story's broken. God, would you fix my story? If you've never done that, I would encourage you, either where you're sitting, we'll have deacons and elders down front, I would encourage you to come to a place where you would say, okay, I need you, I need the great author of life to rewrite my story. And that happens when you recognize that you're a sinner, just like Adam and Eve, and the consequences of your sin, just like the consequences of their sin, is death and, 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 and separation from God and being cast out of paradise. And you confess that and you turn to Jesus, the hero who died for you, and you surrender your life to him. If you've never done that, I would beg you, I would plead with you today to give your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here today and you're going through a chapter in your life that's really hard, and it's making you doubt your faith It's making you question what God is doing in your life. Let me encourage you today to the best of your ability to reach out to him by faith and say, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I trust you. I trust you. And God, you use this bad chapter in my life to mold in me and make me who you want me to be. I I don't have any idea how the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you But would you listen to him today? Would you listen? And then would you respond? Lord, thank you so much that you're a sovereign God. You're a sovereign God who's in control. Your counsels will stand. Whatever you have determined will be accomplished. So God, I just pray that your will would be accomplished in our lives. If there's somebody here today that has never by faith reached out to Jesus Christ, I pray that today would be the day that they would make that decision. For those of us who are struggling with our story, help us to trust in you. Minister to us at our point of need today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.